Okay, thanks. So welcome everybody uh, to this uh, session about uh, resilient healthcare systems. Um, and welcome also everybody on the live stream. Um, it's a bit odd because we did this earlier today and uh, so we're now in sort of repeat mode, but you know, with a new public, so I'm, I'm guess, you know, this will change the dynamic and, and I hope we can be resilient uh, in, uh, in, in sort of creating new discussions. Um, what we're going to focus on today is especially older person care. So um, we've been through this turmoil of the pandemic and um, Trish told us a little bit about that also in the morning about you know the, the way that it went in, uh, in the UK. Uh, but of course in the Netherlands we've been through sort of similar discussions. Um, and one of the things that was noticed I think already pretty soon into the pandemic, uh, but especially now also in the evaluations, is that long-term care was not, not completely neglected, but you know, not so much in the picture. All our attention focused on hospitals, on the ICU, uh, on the throughput of patients in the hospitals. All the measures were constantly sort of legitimated on the basis of, you know, the pressure on the hospitals. And even now, if you look at the, um, at the letters and, uh, and the reports that are sent to Parliament by our Ministry of Health, you can see that, you know, if long-term care is even mentioned, then it's usually in relation to the throughput of hospitals. Um, so the problems within long-term care themselves are not so much addressed, uh, at least not in policy circles. Um, things are changing a little bit. For example, there's been um, uh, uh, a report by some of the elderly care organizations, long-term care organizations, Actis, Forenzo, so the branch organization, professional organizations that have said, we want more attention. And not just in terms of, you know, that we can help in the throughput, but we have our own issues. Um, and also said, you know, we want to work more on the knowledge infrastructure within elderly care and with long -term, within long-term care, because this is one of the things that has been lacking. What is the capacity there? What, how, does, how do treatments look like? What kind of knowledge is built up about, you know, the quality of care within long-term care? All those issues have been, up, are now sort of more put on the, on the front. So we, we thought, you know, we focus on that area because so much attention has already been gone through the hospitals. And uh, luckily enough, we found, uh, we have a couple of researchers within the school who have been doing research on um, long-term care during the pandemic. Uh, and we also invited somebody from, uh, and now I forget the English name again, so the Netherlands School of Public Administration, I think. Yeah, right. Um, who has been working on long-term care for a longer time already and also during the pandemic. So the session will look like this. We have three presentations. Uh, we start off with Andrea Frankowski from uh, the NSOB, uh, then Jeroen van Meijgaarde uh, from our school, who's, who's done research on uh, the position of managers during the pandemic in elderly care, and then uh, René Schepers, who's done research on professionals. So we move from you know macro to micro in a, in a sense. And then we have two, um, guests, um, well, one is, you know, not completely a guest, but the other is more, uh, who are also managers of uh, long-term care uh, facilities, nursing homes, um, who will, you know, I, I, will, I will invite later on to reflect on the issues. Uh, but first, let me welcome Andrea to the floor. And... Uh, <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is uh, Andrea Frankowski. I'm a researcher at, uh, oh, here's a pointer. Yes, there it is. Uh, my name is Andrea Frankowski. I'm a researcher at the Netherlands School of Public Administration, but also a PhD uh, researcher at Tilburg University here in the Netherlands. Um, and my talk today is about uh, a policy reflex. And I will, let me take you along. Um, the background of my, uh, my story today uh, uh, relates to a publication that, uh, th that was recently, uh, or actually not so recent anymore, um, published uh, in a bundle, uh, an ethics bundle, uh, which is called Ethics in Times of the COVID-19 Pandemic, at least that's how I translated it. It actually has a Dutch, uh, Dutch uh, name. 
Um, and it is about um, what we basically did together with my colleagues uh, Henk den Uyl and William Hendricks is uh, we, uh, we reflected on a specific high impact policy measure, namely the, the full lockdown of the uh, nursing homes uh, in the Netherlands. And we put it against the background uh, of more than a decade of reforms in, in, in elderly care, uh, which uh, installed basically a completely different, uh, a completely different uh, movement of uh, a direction that we wanted to go into uh, with elderly care. And we contrast this uh, uh, with each other. Um, well, comparing new a new measure to longer term uh, reforms and longer term policy developments, um, let me just say a couple of quick words about uh, what this is based on. And it's basically uh, based on two research projects, separate projects, one new, one old. Uh, the new project is uh, commissioned research by the Ministry of Health. Uh, that asked us to uh, um, to assess a number of policy measures that they've been taken uh, during the po during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is led by Martijn van der Steen, a professor here at uh, Erasmus uh, uh, at uh, uh, Public Administration. Um, and this is a new uh, research project, but earlier I was actually not involved, my co-authors are, um, but I was involved in the old project um, and that uh, concerns uh, uh, yeah, a decade of reforms in elderly care. Um, and uh, this was conducted earlier. Both projects uh, consist of a, a elaborate document analysis and uh, a large number of interviews. I think both projects uh, entail more than 60 uh, interviews with relevant stakeholders and experts. Um, so comparing a policy measure uh, to these, uh, these reforms. Um, I'll start with the reforms. A decade of reforms uh, intended to reshape uh, elderly care. Um, well, what we've seen is that uh, the, yeah, for over a long period of time, um, the, the, the conception of uh, what good care is or what quality of care is was for long determined by a safety-centered perspective. So uh, care in, 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 in long-term care facilities was long determined by um, a health risk and a medicalization uh, of um, what care is about. And that perspective has um, basically pr um, yeah, made room for broader ideas and broader, uh, a broader concept which more relates to well-being. And this all relates to the idea that care is more, living in a care home is more than just being taken care of in a strict sense. It's about quality of life. It's about well-being. It's about other needs than medical needs. It's about other needs than care needs. It's about emotional needs. It's about social needs. And this movement uh, is very much about uh, co-creation, patient-centered care or client-centered care in this case, um, which concerns with that which is concerned with the idea that, that clients themselves should be involved into the decision making of what appropriate care is for them. And um, I don't know how that happened, but we started regarding uh, people who live in elderly care homes as people who are not patients, basically, but they're not. They're people like you and me, and their home is the care home. So um, if you look at it from that perspective, you start rethinking many of the things that, are, uh, that take place in such care homes. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, uh, fall prevention, so if an elderly person has a risk of falling down, from a safety and, and risk management perspective, you would maybe tie them to a bed, but from a quality of life perspective, you would make a different decision. So this is basically a decade of reforms uh, reshaping this idea of what care in elderly care facilities should be about. And, um, it's also really much about empowering uh, um, elderly people, involving them, uh, and also personalized care. So, uh, and these are not just ideas or thoughts or values that are just spoken about, they're also codified in laws. So in 2014, there was a new long-term uh, care act installed, which basically prescribes that all, uh, um, in, in every nursing home in the Netherlands, uh, care has to be personalized in the sense of everyone is entitled to ha have a personalized care arrangement fit with, uh, and, and with uh, 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 starting from the starting point of quality of life instead of, yeah, this, this previous, uh, previous conception. Um, and, uh, well, more than 2 billion uh, of euros has been invested s since 2015 to basically install these changes because it has a lot of uh, implications also for how you organize care and also how you evaluate care. So there, 
also um, the idea is also that the only ones who are basically um, able to really assess uh, where the results have been achieved should be the client themselves. So this idea of quality and performance indicators uh, making room for uh, more subjective measures such as client evaluations and so how they think the care to them was, uh, how they assess that. So this is basically a decade of reforms, reinstalling and reshaping our notion of uh, what elderly care is about. And then then COVID-19 came and then uh, what happened is uh, what me and my colleagues have labeled a policy reflex. So what happened is that um, the Minister of Health uh, uh, took uh, the restrictive measure of, uh, fully, uh, of a full lockdown of nursing homes and basically what happened is um, on 27 February 2020, so we go two years back in time during the first wave, uh, the first uh, COVID-19 case in the Netherlands uh, occurred and uh, within one week, the first death case in a care home uh, um, took place. And this installed a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety because everyone was thinking, what's going to happen now in the care homes? And this will lead to disasters. And we were, of course, also looking internationally. We saw what happened in Northern Italy. We saw other cases, other situations. And people were really scared of what would happen to our elderly. And what happened is that our uh, Minister of Health, together with the Prime Minister, occurred on national television on 19 March 2020, and they announced a full lockdown uh, of the nursing homes, meaning that all nursing homes were uh, uh, basically only open to the care providers that provided basic care needs. So only basic care, their life was reduced to basic care again, and family members, others, other activities, other visitors were all uh, not allowed to enter uh, the care homes anymore uh, from the safety perspective. So what you see is a strong safety center perspective to protect their lives. Um, but this poses the question, what happened with all the other values? What about asking clients themselves what they want and what they think is appropriate and whether they want to have visitors or not? And um, this also relates to the idea that, so people, people in, in society, like you and me, if we were locked down and someone would decide from, from, from a centralized perspective that we were not able to, uh, to have visited her, we would not accept this. But why, why is it okay to do that to people who live in elderly care homes? Because that's their house. It's not only their care facility. Um, so this basically uh, puts us back into this, this, this whole uh, pre-reform stage. Um, so there was uh, centralized decision making and um, yeah, standards and uniforms, uh, norms were being hierarchically put again, uh, uh, contrary to, the, to this idea of quality of life. Um, so if you think now, so what? Many things changed, the world changed due to uh, COVID-19. So what's the big point in that this one specific policy measure was actually not really fully in line with, uh, with other policies, who cares? Well, I think um, it has specific implications. Uh, in particular, if you think about resilient healthcare systems, it has two uh, specific, uh, or at least two specific, uh, it, it poses specific uh, questions in two different ways. Uh, first of all, it says something about decision-making during crisis. So what if, um, what if this crisis continues? What if we in fall, for example, have another big outbreak? What will we do then? Um, will we be more accepted of safety risk? What is, what, what I think what's really um, interesting and what we've seen now is that this decision of, having a full, of installing a full lockdown in nursing homes was back then maybe quite supported for a short, short period of time, but in the meantime, it's quite controversial. And it's controversial to the extent that health organizations and, and re representative organizations and branch organizations have united and um, recently published a position paper or a vision document in which they state that another full lockdown of nursing homes is a fully inappropriate and unfit decision that they are not willing to take again. So this discourse or this narrative on what's appropriate decision making has definitely changed. And another interesting thing is, is, is put in this uh, vision document, namely that besides the OMT, the outbreak management team, that there should also be a social impact team available, which makes, diff which makes different uh, judgments on also socio social and also societal uh, yeah, sides of this, uh, this story. 
Um, so I think it poses questions on uh, decision making during crisis. So do we want less centralized decision making and who should then decide? Are board members or managers responsible to take different um, no, to take different decisions and also are they brave enough to make decisions which are not uh, directed by a safety centered perspective because it is you know like finally the numbers show that in this first uh, COVID-19 wave um, from March to June more than 8,000 people got infected in care homes and of that population 2,800 people died that's two percent of the entire population of care homes in the Netherlands so there was quite a huge death risk and my question would be for board members um, is it possible and feasible to take the decision like stated in the vision document to not lock down to not install a lockdown is are you able to keep health uh, to keep the facilities open and is this also a legitimate are you able to take that choice given the media pressure given the the political pressure i mean i'm really sure that there will be questions in the, in our parliament right away the next day if if someone would uh, would make this decision so are they brave enough to take that decision um also what does this say for the role of healthcare professionals what which responsibility do they have and we can talk about this a bit uh, in the panel discussion uh, afterwards uh, second, after the crisis. So what does this tell us if we want resilient healthcare systems? Um, what does this policy reflex tell us in hindsight about this reform and about this movement that supposedly took place? I mean, we were quite strong in installing all these ideas about broad well-being and about quality of life. But when the stakes are on the table, when a crisis actually hits us and there's a huge safety risk, are we then willing to actually take these really difficult decisions into protecting those values or not? What does this tell us about where we stand? What does this tell us about reshaping elderly care? What does this say about in which direction we want to develop? And how, how do we want to continue? Do we, is it simply, um, do we learn from this that we were not as far with this broad concept as we thought we were? Is it in hindsight, after all, not so important? Should we go back to having a more safety-centered perspective again? What do we want? Thank you, Andrea. And I think it's uh, you know, really nice and, and, and also very important to, to talk about this sort of value complexity, right? So the different yeah. values that are at stake and for which managers, but also policymakers have to find sort, sort of you know, solutions or, you know, they have to act. Yeah. Exactly. Um, are there any questions for Andrea at this stage? Yeah. Um. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> to stay at home for longer. Um, yeah. um, so in a sense, I think that elderly care has become more medical in that sense, right? Because people stay at home for longer and then only if they really require medical health, they go into long-term care. So how do you reflect on that based on what you were saying that it, it's really their home and not necessarily their care facility? Yes, that's a good question. I think, I mean, at this, this movement of, of, of stay, staying longer at home, longer thuis, this um, definitely poses even more, uh, um, yeah, it, it's even more important, it's even more difficult to actually live up to this ideal of having a quality of life perspective in which other needs are. In particular, I mean, I gave this example of fall prevention, but it's also about either eating healthy or whether you're allowed to smoke, for example. So all these freedoms and rights and things that people like you and me do at home, um, how do we feel about posing, uh, patronizing basically our elderly and, and yeah, limiting them to things that are supposedly better for them? And I think it puts more pressure on this idea, but at the same time, this idea uh, arose at the same time. It's a parallel, I see it as a parallel development. So it, I believe it makes things more complex, but I don't think, I mean, it's happening. Both is happening at the same time, but it adds more complexity, I think. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I think we move on to Jeroen, who, uh, because you've, you, you also formulated sort of a challenge to managers in, in elderly care. And so Jeroen can tell us a little bit more about how that challenge was sort of really lived through and taken uh, by those managers. Um, so the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, let's switch to the next one. Indeed, we uh, did a research, well, especially a case did research. <laughs> he did the interviews um, with uh, a number of managers at the beginning of COVID-19, and we were interested in uh, crisis management. So how does crisis management work out in uh, nursing homes? And when we talk about crisis management, and especially when we look at the literature, but also what we know of crisis management, we figure these types of crises. So an, an, a, a devastating event at a certain moment in time, and we need to do something about it, we need to act upon it. And I think in many ideas about being resilient, they think about these kind of events, and can you bounce back from that, and can you prepare for that? And also when you look at literature, you see that it's often related to this type of crisis. You have a pre-crisis, before something happens, you have to prepare, you have to have an emergency response team, you have to have a, 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 a construction with people in line that have a, 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 to say so. Um, and then you have a crisis, and then you have to act, you have to respond, and then there's the post-crisis and you really have to mop up, basically. Um, and the goals are also set, it's about saving lives, it's projecting your infrastructure, and it's about uh, restore trust. And these are also in the mind when people work with crisis, you have to focus on that. So it's not so only a medical perspective, it's our perspectives on crisis. And there are a number of things you need to do. Um, this morning, uh, Trish uh, told you about Borne and Hart, who had a number of tasks, and these tasks were mostly on a strategic level, but they also define tasks on a more operational and tactical level, and they the are these. So you need to diagnose, so there's an uncertain circumstance, so what is happening and how should we decide? You need to mobilize and organize your resources, that could be anything from uh, help to people, uh, you have to contain, using this resource, you have to contain and mitigate, make sure that the crisis has no any crisis anymore. You have to inform and empower, but in such a sense that you give the right information at the right moment so people can act. And finally, you have to coordinate and collaborate with all units or organizations involved. Well, this crisis had a different phase. Uh, it is a crisis of people living in houses, maybe especially in the elderly home, we didn't see people dying. We saw the figures, we saw, didn't see the people, they were there. We saw um, protective uh, things we need to wear. This was an invisible uh, crisis, partly. It was a totally different crisis also in the way it, it, it developed. Um, what we did was we asked ourselves a number of questions and set a number of aims. So first of all, can we conceptualize this idea of crisis management? in nursing homes, but also in this specific type of crisis? And, and can we also maybe see how these goals and tasks developed over time as this crisis has a different way of, of working? It's like waves that come and go instead of one incident. So does crisis management then change? Is that different? And so which tasks this, these nursing home managers then need to do during uh, COVID-19? Uh, which goals did they pursue? And how did these tasks and goals change during the crisis? So that was the questions we set out to ask. Um, we did, well, case did, <laughs> 70, 46 interviews with seven nursing home directors. One is here, Robert. Um, uh, our current minister of long-term care was also one of the respondents. Um, it was during March, between March and July, so that was the lockdown and just after the lockdown. And we had a focus group with the same people a year later. So what did we find? Well, first of all, you could say that there were two phases we distinguished. There was the first phase, that was the acute phase, basically. And it set out in February, as Andrea told us. And that was a phase in which, um, you know, uh, there was this, uh, this crisis, it was an immediate crisis, and people start acting. And there's such a, there was a, this need for strong leadership, a clear focus, and we needed people to say what we needed to do. 
And there was a lot of compliancy at that moment. Okay, we need to start shut down the nursing home. Okay, we'll do it. So of course there were some people that thought, well, I said a good idea. But at that moment, there was also a lot of solidarity. We hear that uh, uh, insurers said to the nursing homes, do whatever is necessary, it's going to be paid. Don't worry about it. And there was a lot of collaboration also. So there was, uh, in many areas, um, the structure and the networks of elderly care facilities was not that strong, but now it developed, and especially also in the, 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 the south part of the Netherlands, where the virus hit most. Um, you see a very much focus on action. So a bit of a linear focus, we need to act now. Uh, not a lot of time for reflection. So this phase very much resembles what we lead, re read in literature about crisis management. And I think a lot of people also wanted it to be like that, a rational focus on we need to fix this, we need to fix this soon, and we have to act. But that changed. Um, and we come to the second phase, and our respondents talked about the adaptive phase after that. Things changed. Uh, there were People said, well, what we did with the lockdown, after a few weeks, that, that's a bad thing. Uh, and Andrea told us about that also. Quality of life is so important for these people. These people have an uh, average lifespan of nine months when they are in a nursing home. And how can you not let their family in? That is, that's cruel, basically. Um, and we see in this phase that uh, the government also decides to decentralize more of the decision making, realizing that not all nursing homes are the same. So to tackle this, even to tackle the spread of the virus, you need to have measurements that fit your nursing home. And maybe if you want to open up the nursing home, or partly, you need to do that in your own way. Well, f for some that was, okay, finally, we can make that decision. But for others, it was also very complicated. Because at that same time, uh, different values, uh, different opinions, people were not that complicit anymore. There was this media up upcry, and there were all these con uh, contingent meanings of what, what you should do. And that made it difficult for these nursing homes managers. Um, and uh, it was more of a process where they yeah, there was not one decision to be made. It was a slow, iterative process in which you need to reflect also. And luckily, there was time for reflection, because the next phase, the next wave, hit us only in October that year. So a totally different phase. And I think that phase is still where we're currently in. So at, at one thing, we, we, we prepared for a number of things, but at the same time, other stuff happened which we ne needed to deal with. So when we look at those task, we see that there are, these tasks are indeed the tasks that need to be performed. But they changed color over time. They had a different way of working. So for example, diagnosis and deciding. In the first phase, that was mostly about, OK, how's the spread of the virus growing? In the second phase, other things need to be. So how, is, how are, are my people feeling? Uh, are, they, are, they, are they sick? Are they tired? Are they emotional? There are other things you need to take care of. Informing and empowering was not just giving the right information so people could act, but it was about supporting, emotional supporting, tackling a uh, number of controversial issues. So the information also changed and was different. And much more adaptive to the circumstances and protocols changed over time. Um, and you also saw that there are a number of types of work we've seen that is not mentioned much in the literature. So resilience was not uh, something that happened in the pre-phase, the pre-crisis phase, where we made sure that everybody was ready. Uh, resilience was a continuous process. We had these protocols after the first wave, but we needed to change them over time. We needed to test them, change them. There were new challenges. So resilience was an ongoing work, and we did it together. So it was not, not so much the manager that did it themselves, they did it as a team. There was also a lot of emotion work involved. Um, for your own personnel who was angry, afraid, uh, realizing that you know, with the lockdown, if there's still an infection, the only one that, that could have taken that infection in the nursing home that was the personnel itself. So that caused a lot of stress. But there was also a lot of aggression uh, we heard about uh, uh, people wanted to uh, come out and, and at attack the managers because they made the decisions for the lockdown, they said. Uh, we saw a lot of controversy in the, in the media also. So it, that, that required a lot of emotion work. Uh, managers need to make sure that they were visible, 
They, should, they, they work together with others to, to make sure that they are, you know, it's not about strong decisions only, which was enough in the first phase, but in the second phase, it was also about being there. And you made mistakes and you had to discuss that. And there was also a lot of normative work involved. So uh, in the first phase, some said it was quite easy. The government said we need to shut down. And then somehow that made it easier. In the second phase, in the depth of phase, we as the managers were the ones deciding partly what happened. We, we made sure what kind of measures must be taken. And that also meant that we were the ones uh, attacked for it. So what, what a, a number of them did, they, they, they created these ethical committees in which uh, different uh, professionals, but also clients, and, sometimes, and also families were involved discussing, okay, what is a good way of doing that? So as Trish told us from, uh, this morning, it's also about discussing, framing. It's, it's something you need to do together to make sure that uh, you know, there's not one truth anymore. There are multiple values, multiple perspectives, and what is the perspective and perspective for our nursing home, for our situation? So that made it more specific, but also more complicated because different nursing homes made different decisions. If your nursing home nearby decides to be more lenient, it has an effect on you. So that also put a bit of pressure on solidarity in some of these regions, because one was more lenient than the other. Why are you more lenient? In the first phase, that solidarity was so important. In the second phase, it became pressured a bit. But still, I think uh, what we'll see, and Young Case will probably tell us more about that, is in many regions, we now see a more a stronger uh, a network of care facilities, of long-term care facilities. Yeah, what lessons can we learn from resilience, for your resilience? There was not the direct question of this research, but let's, let's speculate about that. I think that we see what's happened and what needs to happen more is this breaking down of the silos. It's not only about a cure that's most important, it's also about care. And what we've seen, what current facilities have done during the crisis to help the hospitals have shown that, the important, that, that they need to work together. And for the future, is that also very important. We need a stronger national representation of long-term care. So it's an important part and an, a growing part of the healthcare sector, and they are hardly visible during the acute phase. Now, one of the respondents is currently the Minister of Long-Term Care, so that's probably going to help. But I think that's one of the things we need to do. Uh, we don't need to see resilience as something that's in a pre-crisis phase. We prepare now, and then when it happens, we're resilient. It's an ongoing process, and I guess especially in these circumstances where we see uh, uh, problems with our workforce and we see new things happening with the complex and dynamic society we have, resilience is part of your continuous work, your everyday work. And we'll discuss later on, and uh, uh, Renee will talk about that resilience also resides in our workforce. I think we were able to tackle things in, in nursing homes because the workforce was so resilient. They were able to adapt, but at a cost. We see a lot of burnouts and people that are now in problem. So it's, it's, it's and the one at the time, it's our strength, our workforce, and then the other time, it's also our vulnerability, especially for the future. I think also the idea of that, that ethical war, that, that, that making these normative questions and asking them and, and um, giving answers together is also very important. Again, when values and norm are, uh, when we don't have one idea about values and norm, but that they're contested, then it's important that we discuss them, that we reframe them, talk about it. And also the relevance of emotion work in times of crisis. So you know, in that acute crisis, emotion work, what the manager does is mostly be there, be available, act, act, act. But when it's a long-term crisis with different waves, something else is expected of our managers. They must be present. They must show that they are involved. And it's a, it's a much more complicated and time-consuming effort also in doing that. Thank you. That was my presentation. Thank you, thank you, Jeroen. And I think the one of the things I, I learned from your presentation is about this resilience as a sort of ongoing accomplishment, right? So often we think of resilience as something that is sort of a characteristic of a system. And Tris talked about that earlier this morning, for example, saying, you know, you have this ranking, you had this ranking of, you know, more, more resilient healthcare systems in the world, and the ones on top failed. 
you know, yeah, completely, yeah. like the US and the UK, and the Netherlands was also way up, and say, you know, African countries were very low in, on that scale, um, but they apparently were more resilient than we were. Uh, but from your presentation, it's, it's sort of this resilience as an ongoing activity, right? So there's work to do, and it's something that you do on the spot and learning. Um, so thank you for that. Um, any questions for Jeroen from you at this stage? Yes. Wait. I <laughs> I'm not sure if this was part of your research. Maybe you could elaborate something on that. Uh, well, we know from literature there is a lot of literature on leadership styles and everything. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, did you see in the interviews some changing leadership styles well, during the, the pandemic and also specific for the nursing home uh, managers? Ooh, that's a difficult... I, I teach in learning styles, so it's a very good... <laughs> uh, you should know about uh, this. I should know right? about it. Yeah. Did, I, did I see a change in, in leading styles? Um, uh, leadership styles. Uh, I think uh, yes, but to, to define it, to, to give us some sort of typology is difficult. I think the first phase was this leader that was visible, that uh, must be um, uh, active, that must uh, be co decisive, full, and, and, and a good collaborator, that was very important. And I think in the second phase, this more emotional, involved leadership style was the more reflective leadership, also about its own em emotions and behavior, uh, making contact with people, talking with people, was more important, I think. So I think it, indeed it changed over time what was required of the leader. But I'm also curious what Robert has to say later on about that. <laughs> so I, I think that because you had a nice couple of reflections about that, also about your, your own leadership style and, and how you had to... So in the, in the first phase, uh, mistakes were also forgiven easily. Everybody makes mistakes in that phase, you have to act, act, act. Later on, mistakes were not so easily forgiven. And you need to focus on it, you need to discuss that, be very open about that, be very vulnerable. And that was, uh, I guess, difficult for, for many managers. Hmm. Is that okay. an answer? Yeah. Well, we have a former leader that now says sorry 20 times in uh, Parliament, right? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so you say the leadership style should be sort of situational, depending on you know, what is the situation and a good assessment of the situation, what is needed up at that moment. Yeah, so I guess that's true. Leadership should, you know, a leader should be able to change. Yeah, and especially Adjust. in these circumstances. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah. okay. Yeah. Can I ask one more question? Did, did you also saw some, so in the beginning there was this like sort of uh, national lockdown of, of nursing homes, and in the sort of second wave, as you described in your presentation, there was some more uh, regional differences and was allowed to have different policies. Do, True. Do, you notice, do you notice differences in characteristics of nursing homes that at that point decided to let in prisoners, for example? Or was this, is that not really apparent to recognize in that? Yeah, that's a difficult one. I only had can, seven. Can you repeat the question because the people oh, sorry, at home cannot hear this? Yeah. So, so there were in, <laughs> later on, p uh, nursing homes could more or less choose more or less if they should have a lockdown, and you ask if there is a pattern in that. Do you see different types of nursing homes responding differently? And that's difficult to say. I, I had seven respondents, so so <laughs> I have to say, and they had many nursing homes. Um, I guess what they said, and that's not really answering your question, but it's that, you know, some nursing homes were in these old buildings and even if you breathed out, everybody was sick. And others, others had these new fancy buildings. And I think that was important. That's why that de decentralization was not a bad thing, because they all had these different circumstances. Mm -hmm. So it, it's difficult to say if there's a different style. I think the facilities also made it, and of course there were more gutsy and less gutsy leaders, I, I have course, but then got the facilities also, also played a part in that. Right. Yeah. Okay, gutsy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So one of the things that you mentioned in terms of, um, and now I'm making a bridge to the next presentation, <laughs> yeah. is, a, is the resilience of the workforce, right? And, the, and both the resilience, but also the vulnerability. And so I'm happy to have René here, uh, who can you know, talk a little bit about that. So thank you, Jeroen, and welcome, René. Thank you. All right, could everybody hear me, hear me well? Okay. 
Uh, yeah, so um, we uh, performed research uh, on the well-being of healthcare professionals in nursing homes. Um, and we looked into how they uh, coped with the changing working conditions and uh, which uh, resilient strategies they used. Um, um, we were specifically interested in this topic since the onset of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, nursing home professionals were exposed to even higher levels of stress than normally because it's known from literature that uh, normally, they already have high workloads and experience stress, but uh, since the pandemic, their patients were vulnerable and suffered from COVID, relatively high death rates in the nursing homes, uh, which was all very stressful and increased levels of burnout among uh, healthcare professionals working in the nursing homes. So their well-being was uh, severely at risk. Um, and. Um, well-being uh, risks are associated with working conditions which changed during the pandemic and we wanted to uh, see how they changed and uh, how this affected their well-being and um, for our research we based our research question on um, the job demands and resources model categori categorizing working conditions into either uh, job demands so stressful aspects of work such as workloads and uh, job resources such as uh, these are energizing aspects of work such as support and this model posits that job demands uh, introduce stress and on the long term lead to burnout while job resources provide energy to uh, professionals which uh, promote their motivation and work engagement which is a positive state of well-being uh, involving dedication um, and the more job resources uh, job resources ultimately decrease burnout levels while job demands um, decrease work engagement and uh, ultimately this also affects organizational outcomes as uh, burned out professionals are less uh, well able to um, contribute to organizational outcomes they are less well able to work effectively for example while work engaged professionals are better able to perform well in their work um, and we investigated these job demands and resources um, in our, our studies. First, we looked at um, how do healthcare professionals experience the impact of the pandemic on job demands, resources, and their well being. And the second research question was how do job demands and resources affect well being of healthcare professionals during the pandemic? Um, five nursing home organizations participated. Uh, one of them was Verande, the <laughs> director uh, is here. Um, and uh, we performed an interview study investigating the first research question and a longitudinal survey investigating the second research question. In the interview study, we performed 22 interviews. Um, and uh, we based our interview guide on the job demands and resources model and on the social production function theory. And we uh, used thematic anal analysis to analyze our transcripts. And in a longitudinal survey, we um, uh, healthcare professionals of the nursing home organizations completed the survey at two measurement points. The first measurement point was in April 2021, when there were relatively low infection uh, and death rates in the nursing homes. And the second measurement point was in November 2021, when there were relatively high infection and death rates in the nursing homes. And we studied um, the results using uh, fixed reg effects regression analysis. In the interview study, we found uh, that healthcare professionals experienced an increase of job demands during the pandemic. And this was in the domain of workloads, physical demands and emotional demands. Um, in the workload, they specifically noticed that, of course, the workload was already high before the pandemic. And during the pandemic, more uh, patients fell ill 
and also the uh, care was more complex. So they had to uh, take various precautions when caring for to prevent infection, for example. Um, also, personnel shortages uh, increased because their colleagues fell ill due to corona, so the workload increased. Um, there were also more physical demands uh, for healthcare professionals since they um, had to use protective equipment and some of them experienced headaches or shortness of breath while uh, wearing face masks. Other, other uh, professionals didn't think it was such a hassle, these face masks. Um, but most of them thought it interfered with uh, caring for patients because patients could not always hear uh, professionals well or understand them well when they wore face masks. And this could be especially problematic when uh, patients or residents of nursing homes felt lonely um, in the case of uh, that the, the visiting restrictions, for example. And this was really emotionally devastating for healthcare professionals to see uh, residents struggle with this loneliness and not always be able to consolidate them um, in, in this regard. Um, while job demands increased during the pandemic, they also experienced still job resources um, at their work. For example, they still experienced connecting with patients and caring for them as the main job resource in their work. Um, and also the collegial support even increased actually during the pandemic. Um, they really felt that their colleagues understood what they all were going through and uh, everybody, they felt their colleagues were open to sharing experiences and sharing worries to support each other. And this boosted actually the, the team of the team cohesion uh, by together caring for uh, nursing home residents the best as they could. Um, they, uh, professionals uh, noticed that at first uh, the organization was still learning on how to best support them during the pandemic. Um, so at first there was unclarity, for example, about which uh, face masks were most safe to use. Um, and um, the communication and information about um, different developments during the pandemic improved. Um, so these things improved, but they still would, would have liked more acknowledgement from uh, leaders or, uh, or their team leaders on the department itself. They would have liked to managers or team leaders to come to the department and just simply ask, how are you? They uh, noticed that they missed this. Um, so this was a point of improvement during the pandemic. And this, this change in job demands and job resources affected their well-being, obviously, in multiple ways. Um, in the social domain, uh, healthcare professionals noticed that they got more appreciation for their hard work, um, not only uh, from uh, nursing home residents, but also from family and friends or people outside the organization. On the other hand, it was complex for healthcare professionals that they, were, they feared getting the virus into the organization or to infect maybe their family and friends with the virus. So uh, this was uh, difficult for them. In the physical domain, of course, during the times of crisis, they uh, experienced excessive fatigue due to the high workloads. They did felt able to recover from it uh, at home uh, because they had more spare time during lockdowns. Um, but it was also complex that they were less well able to employ relaxing activities uh, due to lockdown measures. Um, and they experienced work home interference as uh, reflected in this quote that a healthcare professional was worrying about um, uh, getting infected or if uh, residents would sufficiently be protected for the virus and if the team would be able to carry on delivering all care. So these were uh, the insights from the qualitative study showing um, how uh, wealth care, healthcare professionals experience job demands and resources and well-being. And we also looked at this in the, in the survey. Um, 
uh, at two measurement points, and now I am um, noting, now I'm describing the uh, results in which, um, from healthcare professionals who completed questionnaires at both measurement points. We found that um, in the second measurement point, so when there were more infections and higher death rates, that workloads increased and administrative burden increased as well, while, while collegial support and work engagement decreased. And when looking at this, how this affected, how these job demands and resources affected well-being during the pandemic, we found that uh, the job demands, so emotional demands, workload and administrative burden, impacted burnout. So a an increase in the job demands led to, uh, at, uh, from the first to the second measurement point led to an increase in burnout, while a, an increase in workload from the, second to the f from the first to the second measurement point led to a decrease in work engagement. So, uh, while the job resources, as you see, were not um, substantially associated with uh, the well-being indicators of burnout and work engagement. So investing in these job demands appears most, uh, yeah, it appears most relevant. Um, so uh, when looking back at our research questions, how do professional, uh, professionals experience the impact? We found that COVID-19 measures increased their job demands, but however, there was a buffering role of connecting with patients and supporting colleagues, uh, which helped maintaining their well-being during the crisis. Um, but uh, workload especially uh, affected well-being, an increase in workload especially uh, affected well-being, uh, burnout and work engagement uh, both and emotional demands and administrative burden increased burnout during the pandemic. So what have we learned from resilience of healthcare professionals? Um, well, we found that the healthcare professionals employed different resilience uh, strategies during the pandemic. They persevered despite increasing uh, job demands in uh, connecting with patients and supporting colleagues. And overall, on average, we found only small decreases actually in well-being levels. Um, so apparently they managed quite well, on le uh, despite the increasing job demands. And uh, we found that there is a key role of uh, team leaders to support um, healthcare professionals even better or acknowledge them more for doing uh, the hard work, which is what they noted uh, in the interviews. So this was uh, <laughs> my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, René, and again, a very interesting talk. And it, we have our managers here, so yeah. we're going to ask them, you know, what they do in keeping their workforce healthy later on. But first, maybe are there questions from the audience? Yes, always on the first, the second row. <laughs> Did, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was wondering if you also looked at the correlation between demands and resources, so that people who experience more ne negative aspects do not experience the positive sides, or vice versa. We haven't looked at it yet, because these uh, results are actually kind of hot of the press, we just finished it. Uh, but normally, demands and resources are negatively associated, uh, so there are negative correlations uh, between them. Um, yeah, so the more demands, <laughs> the, the, more, the less resources normally, yeah. But you don't know how, to, how it works No, we, ha we have to look no. into it, yeah, because these were just a preliminary uh, analysis, yeah. Okay. Eric. Well, very interesting study. I was also wondering whether there is a kind of selection going on in the, in, the, in the respondents you have, because you selected the ones who were in T1 and T2, and uh, maybe there were some people dropping out because of stress and workload and all other kinds of problems. And so maybe the problems may be more severe than, than, than the ones who were included in your uh, research. 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, there's definitely a, a selection bias, of course, um, because yeah, these questionnaires were set out during Corona, and of course, not everyone attended them. Was very busy. Um, um, that, that might be visible in the levels uh, of uh, on the outcome measures, of course. Um, it is questionable whether it's also visible in the strength of the associations. Um, we will have to look into that. Uh, the strength of the associations is, has been found in multiple studies uh, to be yeah, quite uh, comparable, um, but we have to look into it, how it works during the pandemic. Yeah. Yes. Rene, do you know how many people actually, you know, from the T1 actually left uh, care, uh, the care organizations that they were working in um, before T2? Before, I don't, yeah, <laughs> that would be kind of a guess, actually. We invited actually mm -hmm. the, same, mm -hmm. the same people. Um, I don't think very many, but I have to look into the numbers yeah. of the organizations. Okay. Do you have an idea, Harry, if many people dropped out or le left your organization during the pandemic? No, I can't, I can't say really, no. No. I mean, a lot of people left. Uh, left. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But, but you don't know how many? No. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, can I invite the uh, young Kate and Robert to, uh, to sit here and discuss with us? Um, because there's quite some questions actually to you, right, as um, directors of healthcare organizations. Um, so, but maybe, you know, first, can I ask you to respond more overall to, to, this, to, the, to the talks? Uh, and you need the mics. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. So. <laughs> right, we were talking about the, the well-being perspective and the, the total lockdown of the nursing home was... Um, devastating for some of our residents so um, uh, we also talked about uh, pragmatism this morning by Trish and I uh, talked this morning about creative pragmatism to um, find solutions for uh, the well-being of our residents and at that period we um, uh, we came up with uh, a specific solution we, we, we put we set up big tents in every garden of our nursing homes we have 60 nursing homes and we set up the, these tents with a transparent screen in the middle uh, that divided the tent into halves, one half for the family and friends, and the other half for our residents. And that took a lot of pressure off uh, the situation. So they could see each other, they could talk with each other, and uh, they could almost touch each other. So that was uh, a creative pragmatism. Mm. Uh, so with the, even within the lockdown, you could be creative and resilient in the, in the sense of, you know, also in terms of the different values that were at play. So it was right. safety, but it was also this, you know, quality of life or, yeah. That's right. Okay, okay. <laughs> Robert, do you want to respond? Yes, sure. I was a respondent, uh, but I'm also a teacher here, so uh, it was quite uh, interesting also to combine those two worlds of research, education, and being a CEO. But I had quite a specific situation. I only work with people with dementia, uh, mostly at homes. Uh, and I, uh, we have a little facility. I work at Giriant uh, for people with dementia. And on top of that, behavioral psychiatric problems. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned there, there is the, the, the word wave is interesting here. Mm -hmm. We had waves within our institutions. The second episode, the third episode, that did particular things to worn out resilience. But especially in, in this vulnerable care group, we also saw waves throughout the healthcare system. Started with the hospitals, indeed. Then second, nursing homes. But even the nursing homes in row forgot home care. So the mm -hmm. second wave of crisis was in home care. Mm -hmm. uh, because that were also kind of lockdowns. People with dementia have to go to daycare facilities. They were locked down. Mm -hmm. They don't have their transport. They had to use transport from the municipalities. Mm -hmm. Lockdown. Mm -hmm. So people with dementia at home 
were isolated also. Third wave of the crisis. Mm -hmm. And finally, and I think we still have to find out what that really meant, the informal caregivers of these people at home are in crisis. They are worn out as much as our official staffs, mm -hmm. nurses, uh, caregivers. And, and what I felt also in our region, I was part of the weekly meetings of 17 CEOs in the whole elderly care system, which still exists about collaboration and mm -hmm. the long-term effects of okay. that. In the same way that the nursing home has to come out and express their needs, mm -hmm. I had to express the needs for people living at home, even at my, to my colleagues. So, with the first, uh, is it real what we do with the transition from medical orientation to welfare and well-being? I also see another elasticity <laughs> pulling back, and that's the classical hierarchy of the white uniforms in the hospitals, mm -hmm. still on top of the hierarchy, mm -hmm. then nursing home, then home care. Mm -hmm. And that's the same kind of struggle. Yeah. And also that came back. Yeah, okay. So I think we have to learn a lot more than just crisis management. It's, yeah. it's more intense. And, uh, so if we talk about crisis and risks, in our field we are also dealing with guilt. You had to put your parents in a nursing home. Mm -hmm. For 70% of all the families, this is a question of guilt. Uh, and that made it so painful that you had to go to the windows to say hi. Yeah, okay. So, and, and we learned also from, I think, Jeroen's research, right? So this, this importance of emotion management, for example, both in relation to the workers, but probably also to re residents and, and families. So can you tell us a little bit, and, and that becomes even harder when they're not in a facility, but when they're at home. Um, so, I can, so, so what did you... Could you tell a little bit what you what did you do in order to um, to well well you already told us about the tents um, so these are very much about the families but it's also about the workers so their experience of you know feeling guilty of bringing in, bringing maybe bringing COVID into the nursing home or um, um, their s stress levels in terms of you know seeing so many people die or being very ill um, and you maybe also in relation to um, the people at home. So was there anything that you could do or was it just, you know, we have to endure this and then see how we can bounce back, if we can bounce back? Robert talked about uh, the people in the daycare facilities. We also have daycare facilities, but we uh, still let them come to our daycare facilities because mm -hmm. our uh, staff uh, thought it would be a very, very bad idea to let them stay at home mm -hmm. it would be uh, much worse. And you could arrange transport and those kinds of things? Yes, so we made uh, arrangements with uh, the taxi company. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. In, in, my, in my region, we had another situation. The, the nursing homes really said no here. Mm -hmm. uh, and we found new solutions with uh, voluntary uh, organizations. Mm -hmm. uh, we called it one is... Uh, N is one daycare, so we made new arrangements about uh, around, I think we, we managed to do this for only 150 people. N is one arrangement with voluntary care, uh, the, the car for the neighbor, another driver, uh, perhaps the, the neighbor, uh, bringing it in a particular facility, mm -hmm. no other patients, no other caregivers, mm -hmm. one on one, mm -hmm. there make a good day, meaningful day. And that was our daycare yeah, yeah, solution. Yeah. And I can, so, so that's wonderful, right? So that's, and, and I think that we've all seen that in a sense, that especially during the first wave of the pandemic, so the first you know, formal wave of the pandemic, there was this you know, enormous solidarity and creativity going on, right? And people setting up all kinds of services, uh, especially also in neighborhoods, you know, people helping out each other and those kind of things. Um, but then it lasted for another two years. So how do you keep that up? Do, is, is there, and of course nursing homes opened up, so, so the problem there was less, you know, there, there was 
other rules maybe of uh, maybe you know one visitor a day or all those kinds of things and slowly it it it, it those measures went away but people at home might be might be a little bit different right so people were scared um, uh, so how did you uh, prolong that over a longer period of time because, because I can imagine that you know those enthusiasm of the beginning and the creativity and the energy sort of waned out yeah that's correct uh, your room with the, with the leadership's question of one of the people in the audience uh, is quite right uh, the first months were terrific for mm. a CEO <laughs> for a manager finally we can do something <laughs> act 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 I'm a man with energy I love that face <laughs> Uh, and it was necessary because why it's a crisis you don't have the routines to act upon uh, resilience is also about having your routines knowing the energy uh, okay but you can uh, also me myself after three months I was worn out mm -hmm. 24 7 duties and I was in my organization for one thing sure I live in Rotterdam and in the region I didn't live in Rotterdam that in that period mm -hmm. I was there mm -hmm. being there was one of the biggest things to do um, getting the stories was another thing mm -hmm. uh, also in the collaboration and in your stories to the insurance companies they were all not all that enthusiastic to, to source us <laughs> in, the, in the right beginning because they didn't know themselves either mm -hmm. also they hadn't their routines in place so you make a crisis team and I was head of the crisis team of course you have to act uh, but then you have to organize the I don't know the real English verb the contradiction the, the feedback mm -hmm. organized feedback mm -hmm. are we going the right things if it if we decided to do it that way bring us back your experience and where you managed and where you failed it's not a failure it's about learning how to cope with an unknown crisis mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and quite soon we decided to go back to normal routine and skip the crisis team we did that in autumn in the first year mm -hmm. Uh, because you can't ask people to sprint and sprint and sprint over again mm -hmm. and to rethink your crisis management over and over again so we did quite a work and there was an evaluation in the summer times what do we learn that we can incorporate in normal mm -hmm. routines mm -hmm. and of course we had to practice you can't foresee everything but making it as normal to manage crisis was my big learning point okay, okay. Did you, did you also experience this, this sort of normalization of the crisis? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's familiar what, what Robert says. I think that in the first, um, uh, first months, the, the, the most uh, care was given to the residents. And uh, our staff was very uh, strong and resilient. They wanted to take care of the situation. But in uh, the last few months of 2020, uh, there was the second wave and our uh, caregivers were uh, a bit tired of the situation and, and um, were a bit down that, that they had to go to the same uh, again. Mm -hmm. So we tried to, uh, to boost their uh, resilience by supporting them with innovation because innovation was needed to boost them. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we have um, uh, like 10% of our staff is uh, healthcare students and the healthcare students, they got too little attention from the working staff. We are also a part of the working staff who were at home uh, because of um, uh, um, the, because of sick leave. Mm -hmm. But they were they weren't all that sick. Uh, some of them um, could could make a productive uh, contribution contribution to their colleagues working in the nursing homes. So we asked them to uh, guide the uh, students who wore a smart glass from a distance. Mm -hmm. So they could talk to them because a smart glass is also a cell phone, it's a mobile phone, and they could see what the students saw at that moment. So our student could go on with the learning process and the working staff at home could uh, give a, 
a contribution to their colleagues still working at the nursing homes. And that, uh, that made a big, a big effort to do it with each other, also mm -hmm. the people at home. Okay, great. Nice example. We had yeah. the third crisis in our facility. And it was uh, around uh, Christmas time uh, in 2020. And mm -hmm. there I made a big mistake. And that's also how you learn. <laughs> But this was a real big one. Although my intentions were good. Um, Those are the best ways. The people yeah. asked for rest. They came back from holidays in the summer times and they were not re-energized. Mm -hmm. It has been too much. So when we had uh, dealt with our September startups, they said, okay, we have handled this crisis, September, can we take one week of rest? Uh, and that meant no new patients into the facilities. We, had, uh, we were at a, a rate of only 60% filled beds. Mm. Can we keep it that way for one week? That was the only thing they asked me. On Thursday that week, I got a call from a desperate colleague CEO from another nursing home. They had an older person which completely deteriorated into all kinds of aggressive behavior. The expertise of my facility. Mm -hmm. How to handle with this very different behaviors. Their staff was also worn out. Could you please help us by taking over this patient? I said yes. Because of the intentions. You have to help those people which your facilities mm -hmm. are meant for. Mm -hmm. And I went to my manager. Mm, I got this call from my colleague. Can we do this intake? Yeah, of course, that's our duty. But we forgot to ask the our staff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And they were mad at us. Totally right. Although we had thought we were back in routines, and this team is known for its commitment to this patient group, mm -hmm. they, they do overtime all over again to take everyone in, mm -hmm. this one was too much. Yeah. And without any communication, oh, wrong, 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 wrong. Yeah. We all know it. But I was also in the squeeze of what is the purpose, the mission of what we have to do mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. each client again and handle this. Yeah, okay. So I think sort of summarizing, and, and it's good that you reflect on that because, you know, we all make mistakes and, and especially during crisis, right? We, you know, all, I make mistakes all day, so um, um, yeah, and, and, and then you try to learn from them, right? But, and, and I think, so what is fascinating in your stories is that this, and this, this connects also to Jeroen's um, idea of this resilience as an ongoing activity. Um, and you also try to put that within in your organizations. And, um, and then we make mistakes, and I think that was, you know, throughout the healthcare system, right? So we have been in, not so much in nursing homes, but in hospitals. You saw the same thing. Um, you know, the pressure on the hospitals was not so much from COVID patients in the, in the summer of 2020, but it was from all the other patients that weren't there. And so there were no holidays or, you know, very restricted holidays. And that was, those were real mistakes also being made. Um, but, you know, following up on that, so what, if we, if we talk about resilient healthcare systems in a more general sense, right? So um, what are your lessons from the pandemic in terms of the future of the um, uh, of long-term care, so what what are what are the main lessons that you draw? And I think Robert, you already said one thing that remains um, is this collaborative collaborative effort, right? These calls with your 17 colleagues in in the region. Uh, I think in case you already mentioned also, for example, the role of technology and the and innovation is needed uh, to keep um, um, you know to keep on working. Um, but maybe you can... Perhaps in the collaboration part. Collaboration in itself, of course, no one can say no to that. But real collaboration, we learned, and we, we made a little article about that ourselves, is that you have to find a way, a dialogue way to discuss the stakes and to discuss the possible solutions and their, the pitfalls and then decide together. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, what we learned, uh, 17 CEOs, all quite statures, 
don't uh, and who's then the chair of these meetings mm -hmm. uh, just a tiny little thing <laughs> <laughs> who's the chair of these weekly meetings well one of the biggest uh, said well that's our system responsibility mm -hmm. one of the little tiny uh, colleagues said mm -hmm, i don't know have all the knowledge i'm a bit shy to do this and we learned that those in between middle-sized uh, are the people to chair these d difficult <laughs> discussions and he did wonderful work but there were quite some lessons there mm -hmm. uh, we also learned to express these stakes mm -hmm. these are rightful stakes mm -hmm. every organization has to deal with money with staff with image uh, with communication and that are really real stakes mm -hmm. If you don't know that from each other, you can't make the next step to a solution. Mm -hmm. And then you have to organize. Last thing we learned, we had two or three uh, dwarsdenkers, other out of the box people. <laughs> yeah, dwarsdenkers. <laughs> dwarsdenkers. <laughs> we gave them their chair to do this. Mm -hmm. You're so good at finding the contra argument. Help us, give them again so that we can improve the collaborative solution. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and that was so beneficial that we decided to put that in place. So every half year, all the CEOs come together, discuss the ongoing projects in the region, our mandates. Otherwise, all people are all, all the same tables over and over and over again. But especially we learned to talk about the pitfalls, the stakes and how to come out of that. Okay. We learned one thing from crisis is that um, uh, hospital care and elderly care should work together. Um, uh, hospitals uh, got on more and more uh, COVID patients and they scaled down their planable care. Mm -hmm. So we didn't receive uh, total hip and total knee patients on our geriatric uh, rehabilitation. So we got an empty space there. And we said to the, uh, the people at the hospital, you can bring your medical stable COVID patients to us. Mm -hmm. So we take care of them and you can uh, open your hospital for more new patients. Mm -hmm. So with simple capacity management, we uh, helped each other uh, and we, 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 learned to, uh, we learned from each other in taking care of COVID mm -hmm. patients mm -hmm. and what the strength of the one party was and what the strength of the other party was. Yeah. So we, we know each other much better now than we did before COVID crisis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was yeah. one thing. In crisis, you see the real competences of people, uh, but also unknown competencies which they do at home mm -hmm. in their voluntary clubs or whatever, but never on the working place. And that was also very beneficial because we had to solve everything mm -hmm. in that location mm -hmm. Uh, cooking, uh, day activities, a and nurses, some nurses were excellent in telling stories. They never did, but they, they did it as a mother on the schools. Mm -hmm. Come on, no, just a little yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But there are okay. so many unknown competencies in our working forces, not the official roles, mm -hmm. but the, all those other things. Yes. That was also a learning okay. point. Okay, that's nice. So maybe one last question before we open up to discussion. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, what time do we have? Less than 10 minutes. Okay. Open up. <laughs> open up. Yeah, come on. Why open up? Uh, they have them. Uh, you're allowed. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you can share them, right? Oh, sure. Well, first of all, very good that there's a session dedicated to elderly care nursing homes because normally the hospitals and the ICs dominate uh, the discourse. I'm a purely lay listener, uh, and it could be that a message I get here, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I hope to be wrong, is that we solved it ourselves, we learned our lessons, we proved to be resilient, and next time we will be even more resilient. Well, still, this is the session on how to work towards resil resilient healthcare systems. Uh, we know that at the Ministry of Health, uh, enormous numbers of people are working on pandemic preparedness for the next pandemic, whatever. 
Now, for you as a sector, is there anything you as a sector ask or even demand from the system, the healthcare system, or the Ministry of Health uh, in terms of pandemic preparedness? Or is the message you sent me home with as a lay listener, well, we are fine, we, we managed, we will solve it even better next time, we learned our lessons, if anything, a little bit less top-down interference, but that's it. Is there anything you ask from the system? <laughs> Can you answer that? I'm thinking this over because I know this man. And the next question is coming. <laughs> um, I think with uh, the collaboration in, in the region and with uh, bringing people together on a uh, work floor level, uh, nurses from the hospital, our nurses, but also managers, middle management and members of the board, bringing them together. We got to know each other so well. I think we are prepared for another crisis. Um, and I think uh, less uh, government control should be best uh, to, do, to make our own decisions because we know what's right for this population. For example, the total lockdown of nursing homes, we, we don't want it anymore. So we want to make our own decisions because we know what's best out of this crisis. <laughs> Robert, do you agree? No, just for the sake of the discussion. <laughs> I think that's too easy, with all due respect. I was uh, quite fond of the first lecture about what's the real undergoing evolution in our philosophy of vulnerable people. Crises make people vulnerable. Policymakers as patient as staff. And that requires no shifting of roles and authorities, but blending. So that there were only doctors in the OMT at the beginning was wrong. Don't do that ever again. So bring in the whole system. Bring in the whole system. Get out of your silos. What on the on one of the last slides of Jeroen. That also holds for the ministry. They still have their own silos of the CURE, the Long-Term Care Act, uh, even the municipalities are in other department. And we can only solve these very wicked, complex, multi-headed issues if we take a system approach. Uh, so that would be a very important but also very difficult thing. Uh, and, and the other thing, perhaps to say a bit more about vulnerability, it's not done between leaders to talk about their own vulnerability, but we have to. Mm -hmm. We had our own mirrors to face what we did, what we did wrong, what was the first time for, for us also to deal with a thing like this. Uh, and there is an awful lot of crisis management, a scenario uh, practice in hospitals, but not in the nursing home care system. We have our BAV uh, uh, things, but not a system-wide crisis. So mm -hmm. give us the possibilities to learn to manage crisis. I th really, we need that. And now it's COVID. Next time it's one million people from Eastern Europe. The third time it might be, well, whatever. A flood, yeah. What is the responsibility of the sector itself in that? So you, know, you could say, well, we, we you know, hold our hands up to the government, you know, give us money, uh, give us professors, give us, you know, whatever. Uh, not too much, professor, please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we already have one, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, so what should the sector itself do to, to enhance that? Yeah, there are numerous things, I think. Uh, some practical things. Do you have your resources, additional resources for when it's needed? Resource preparement. Mm -hmm. um, we started vitality programs for our staffs. Also, the, the, we already wanted it. But mm -hmm. now we have seen that you really have to do this because mm -hmm. people can cope with one crisis in a wave but the second and third way runs out. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Okay. We okay. have to learn to, to do stakeholders management, really, a very basic uh, gift <laughs> in good times, but another skill in bad times. Mm -hmm. okay. And we have to take that role, I think. Yeah, so take the responsibility. You had a question, Renee, yeah. and I'm not sure if your mic is working. No, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just in response to your question, what uh, made the nursing home sector need from the system? Um, from my impression with the, uh, on the interviews, um, maybe I was wondering um, the, just making the uh, profession of nurse in nursing homes more attractive so that personnel sh or maybe better paid, I don't know, uh, that uh, there will be less personnel shortages and this will decrease workloads, uh, especially during crisis. So that was uh, what I was thinking, what may, what the government may help to do. Okay, you have a question over there. Yeah, maybe also adding to that. So uh, we're talking about resilience, right? So maybe also related to that. So if a new pandemic might hit us, what, how can we make the system more resilient? And also maybe looking at the results of your study, you could say that quite a lot of healthcare staff was working on that sort of, well, not final breath, Faces in Dutch, but so they were really pushing themselves beyond the limit, and uh, I think it's quite questionable if they would do that again if the next uh, pandemic would hit us this winter. So I was wondering if you guys have any ideas. I mean, I think that's a big part of resilience as well, mm -hmm. that the workforce could handle it as well again. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you guys have any ideas on how to cope with that in case it would happen again. Yeah, I think you already mentioned that a little bit, Robert, in the sense of the vitality programs and those kinds of things. But it's also maybe becoming more attractive as a sector to to get more people in. Is, is that working? Or maybe collaborate ac across uh, services uh, in order to share? Yeah, uh, but you already did that. But perhaps mm -hmm. I didn't mention because of that. <laughs> I have quite a few of doctors and they work in all kinds of other facilities to, to help out. Mm -hmm. so, so share staff. Basically, uh, without your own stake, uh, as the first thing to think over. Um, but perhaps also, we have an enormous, powerful, competent sector. Uh, our nurses are dealing with complex situations, which is astonishing. They know so much about behavioral interactions, about diseases, about bringing in informal and formal resources. They, they are real knowledge workers, basically. Mm -hmm. But we don't address them in that way. Mm -hmm. So stop being Calimero in the healthcare sector. We have a tremendous workforce. We do a tremendous good work for the most vulnerable people in our society. Unsi uh, silent, unseen. But bringing them quality of life is an enormous, mm -hmm. ambitious, mm -hmm. knowledge-driven, and, 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 well, okay. thankful work. And we have to no be more proud, stand up, and take our duties to bring that further. Okay, okay. Well, that's a wonderful message, I, I would say. Sort of empowerment of, of long-term care within the healthcare system. And I think that is very much needed. And it's, you know, the struggle that we've seen during the pandemic, I think, you know, not only in the OMT, but also in the Ministry of Health and in many other places where the sector has been somewhat, you know, invisible, for at least in the public eye, uh, whereas lots of the strength of the healthcare system is actually resided over there. So thank you for, you know, being here with us and thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, thanks to the presenters uh, for uh, having your wonderful stories um, and insights. Thank you for joining us and for your wonderful questions, you know, and the rest, of course, <laughs> as well. Um, so. We're heading for a break, and then at four, I think, uh, we'll have uh, the final talk of the day, the plenary from uh, Mike Drummond. Uh, but for now, uh, you can have coffee, tea, and whatever you want um, next door, and have a chat with each other and maybe with others as well. So thanks. <laughs>